thanks so much for coming. My name is John Dickens. Um, thanks for attending this presentation. I work in video games and as such, I feel a bit of an imposter here talking about IA, which is very much the domain of people working in content, web and app, but I'm really glad to be able to uh, talk to you all about game settings. So a quick introduction about what I do at PlayStation. As part of a user research team, our central role at a quite high level is to help make our games a best in class. And that means my, that my team leverage research to make this happen. We are one of the main conduits of feedback between our players and the developers making the game. And we do this from the very start of development all the way from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. At first, sort of before we dive into IA and, and our work in IA, I wanna provide some context about usability in video games because many of you are likely very familiar with what that looks like in a web app or service context, but perhaps less familiar with usability within games. Although I have spotted a bunch of games user researchers here in the chat today. So this will be uh, your bread and butter, I expect. So it's long been established that in traditional usability, we have these sort of three core aspects of usability, effectiveness, can users achieve actually and, and do what they want? Can they complete tasks and achieve their goals? Efficiency, how much effort is required to do that? Satisfaction, um, their attitudes towards the system, you know, is it satisfying to use, easy to use? But with traditional usability, we're typically looking at a clear goal. And the path to achieving that goal is often quite well defined when things are good and, and users can achieve this goal quickly and easily if it's doing it well. And most of the time, you want to remove as much friction as possible. But when you apply these aspects to games, things aren't quite as straightforward because friction in games is really kind of fun. It makes it's part of what makes it a game. If we were to, to design games in a way to how most websites are designed using this sort of these pillars of usability, we'd probably have something that looks like this. And um, that's not really a fun game. Um, in, in games, is really rarely such a clear goal for a user. It's typically for people to have fun. And what this means varies greatly from individual to individual and the path that they take to get there is often not very clear. And with this lack of clarity, we rely much more on the designer's intent. That is what experience does the designer want players to have. So ultimately what I look out for as a UX researcher in the field of video games is are there any barriers that get in the way of the players having fun and ensuring that the player experience matches the designer's intention? And this really can be split down into three broad aspects. Firstly, I'll just go back a slide because I think I may have cut off um, a little bit earlier than I thought. Um, what, what we're looking for in usability in games is really three things, knowing what people are supposed to do, um, knowing that they, can, that they know how to do it, and also can they do it? Um, I, when I cut off, I was talking about accessibility and I'll kind of do a, a quick tour through this. Um, in terms of how we are defining disability and accessibility, this is, this is really sort of a core um, uh, frame, like mindset that we, we need to sort of follow in order to um, think about it properly. Uh, and that really is disability uh, in its simplest form is something that is someone's medical condition and that medical condition encounters a barrier that prevents a person from accomplishing a task such as a staircase or in game terms, low contrast text or no subtitles. And frustratingly, in the majority of the cases, the barrier is typically something that we or society has created. And removing or preventing those barriers is enacting a form of accessibility. Now in games, we need to balance moments of challenge and interesting gameplay with accessibility considerations. And that can be difficult, but it's absolutely not impossible. Games should be built with accessibility in mind from very early on in development, but a big part of making our games accessible in, in, in one way is to ensure that players have a raft of customization over their gameplay. Most typically that comes in the form of game settings and features. So uh, if you've been watching The Last of Us, you'll probably um, know that this is um, what this is. Uh, it's a scary monster. Um, and in, in games, and, and The Last of Us Part Two, uh, as, as the game is a really great example of some accessibility um, revolutions, really. 
Um, settings like high, high contrast mode, um, for instance, can help players with low or reduced vision to more clearly make out enemies and interactive objects in the world. And they typically exist in a menu that might look like this, uh, and often there's several options per setting. Stripped back, it might look something like this, and most of the time we'll have a description of the setting which helps the players understand the impact of enabling or changing it. And here's where information architecture comes into play. With so many games launching with a ton of amazing accessibility settings, it begs the question, where do these settings go? What do we call them? What group do we give to them? Well, we need to consider a few things in terms of this question. Obviously, we need players to find the setting easily, and we also need players to understand what the setting does. So what if we literally just call it what it is and put them in a group that says accessibility? Well, this makes our job easier. We can just put all the settings we think are related to accessibility in one menu. It also means that players who know they're looking for a setting associated with accessibility can probably find it in there. And it's also a nice way to show the players that we're making games with these sort of settings and considerations. But doing this brings a load of other questions. How do we determine that a setting is something exclusively relating to accessibility? Do players associate their needs with this word? And are we even reinforcing some form of othering by putting these settings in a separate place? Well, the answer is in something called P's. Um, and uh, it's not really, but this is an acronym that I've sort of used to describe this work, Player Experience of Accessibility Settings. It's a name used for two separate rounds now of research that we've done in this area. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So let's dive into some research. Um, I'm going to take you through a whistle stop tour of that first round of research where we wanted to identify a number of things. The first being the settings that players are using the most. What's the mo most important settings for our players? Why do they use those settings? We also wanted to deliver insights to our teams that make these games that will guide how we organize settings in our titles. How can we improve the user experience of navigating a settings menu, finding the right settings, understanding what that setting does? And we wanted to understand specifically how players organize and understand accessibility settings. Can we get da data to help us closer to this accessibility settings question? Um, this was a, a big project and it's one of two rounds that I'm going to talk to. Um, so I'm just going to go straight into mostly a, a very quick overview of a method and then straight into the data. If you have any questions about um, specifics of, of how we did this, then it's probably best to reach out to me because I, I won't have time to cover them right now. So uh, we recruited for a large scale survey, um, essentially asking players the settings they see as essential and why. And simultaneously, we ran a card sort with moderated and unmoderated sessions. We gave them a list of settings loosely based on the game you just saw, The Last of Us Part Two. And were asked, we asked them to create their own groups from scratch. Half of both the unmoderated and moderated groups identified as having accessibility requirements. And these include a range of vision, hearing, and cognitive mobility disabilities as well. So some key takeaways, and really there's, there's five here. First, all players are reliant on having flexibility in their settings, regardless of if they have a disability or not. And secondly, one setting serves multiple purposes. Subtitles are a really good example of this. Um, they're, of course, useful for hard of hearing or deaf players, but we also heard of players using them because they're in a noisy environment or they're on voice chat with their friends. Maybe they're not fluent in the game's language. Maybe the characters in the game have really strong accents. Uh, maybe players want to play their own music whilst in the game. Or one of the more interesting ones and something kind of for, you know, the modern age, I guess, is that players want to improve the experience of viewers when posting their videos to YouTube or Twitch. As well as that, players use things like high contrast mode, which we saw earlier, um, not because they had difficulty seeing those enemies or, or objects, but they just wanted to make their experience um, purely focused on being able to find all the collectibles in the game and just being able to do that super quickly. They could do that with high contrast mode. Another key and perhaps more predictable takeaway in this work is that players always grouped related settings together. And that, this is probably expected, but it's not actually always a convention that is followed. 
And really the big takeaway for, for, for me and, and for the direction of this work uh, in, in the round two um, piece that we'll look at in a second, is something that kind of gets us closest to this answer of, of where these settings go. Um, in, in the card sorts, players generally might expect an accessibility group, but actually the number of settings that strongly relate to that group based on that exercise and based on the data we have was really minimal. And it was really only two settings colorblindness and text speech modes that always exclusively found their way into the, this accessibility group. So for our next study, we wanted to focus in on that last, last takeaway. Important to note here, actually, that on that last point, this is true of a game that had an accessibility menu in it and a game where we basically took those settings and yet players didn't always create their own accessibility menu. So that's one of the sort of crucial things to, to uh, us following this research on. So we wanted to sort of try and answer the following question in the next round of research we did, which is essentially how would a variant of settings without a defined accessibility group form in comparison to a variant with an accessibility group? The natural thing to do after performing a card sort is to sort of run a tree test and validate some results. And that's kind of what we did. Um, this time we use settings from a real game um, making sure players are briefed on what time of type of game it is if they didn't know. So we try and eliminate as much as much adaptation as possible. Uh, we use a game called Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Um, I want to be clear that we were not trying to find shortcomings of the settings or that game. It's it's a really fantastic game with many fantastic settings and features that have been rightly sort of lauded and uh, in the community and, and got a lot of awards for. But it's, it's one of our games It served as a convenient title for us to use as a model for this research when, when we were doing it. Um, the method we, in terms of a tree testing method, there was a bit of a twist here. And, and it's not always a case where we might present the contents of a group to our participant uh, and to sort of end points of a group, but that's what we did. We wanted to try and simulate a game setting menu as closely as we could, which meant presenting the full thing to players including descriptions of the settings. We really wanted to assess the potential friction of navigating a menu based on their mental model of what the setting is and how it should be grouped compared to sort of our mental model. And that's the reason for sort of exposing um, the full kind of um, end points of these groups rather than leaving it sort of abstracted. So to do this, we created three variants of what we'd show to players. And this is essentially sort of an A, B plus C test, I guess. Variant one is actually what the game shipped with. Um, so we wanted to test variant two with like an, a, against a live product, essentially. Um, I'm going to refer to these groups quite a lot in the next bit of research. So um, apologies if you, if you can't follow it and remember what these groups are, but I, I'll try my best to keep reminding you. So variant one um, is what the game shipped with. Um, we wanted to, basically this, this had a um, accessibility men menu in the game, but within that, those settings also existed in the main body of settings. So it took this sort of process that we refer to as duplication. It meant that one setting actually existed in two places and, and that happened quite a lot. So something like screen shake existed in the sort of main body settings, visual screen effects, but also in settings, accessibility, visual and contrast options, motion sickness, screen effects. So players could find it in two places and enable it in two places. Variant two, and this is something that was one of our creations uh, alongside variant three, is where we only put these settings in the accessibility menu and we, we had no duplication going on. So they existed only in one place. And variant three is, uh, again, something that was guided by the standardization process and the aggregation that we did of the previous rounds card sorts. And it's a version where there are no settings duplicated, there's no accessibility menu, and instead all of these options are in the main body of the settings. So that screen shake option, for instance, only exists under the main body of visuals, screen effects, screen shake. Uh, this is kind of what they look like. I'm only showing you this as a visualization really of the extent of the changes that we made. And as you can see, it's actually not a great deal. But if anything, this research proves how moving maybe 10 or 15 items 
actually makes a massive difference in, in the performance of uh, these IAs. A quick note also about these two settings, colorblind filters and text-to-speech. And this is something that the game didn't ship with, but we included this in the all three variants test room because they were quite contentious in round one. So we wanted to see if we could get any further insights in them and uh, spoilers, we did. Right, let's blast to the findings. Across all groups, players always hit barriers in finding the setting that they were tasked with for whatever reason. And they're mainly for the following reasons here that we have sort of uh, chunked together. I'm gonna go through some of the examples now where we can look into these barriers and how they came about. And it's likely that these barriers are very similar to what you might get in IA in uh, more traditional sort of services like web. So if you're in that industry, and were up until this point getting bored of my talk, now's the time to listen up because it's probably quite relevant. Firstly, word misdirection. So what was happening here is there's certain settings that we had like icon and prompt size, rift, tether, prompts, and they fail to draw players correct to their correct location in the groups because of that word prompt, driving associations with what they told us were things like tutorial messaging, onboarding messages, and things like that. So players were looking for something that related to their association that was in this case incorrect. Secondly, this pure sort of unfamiliarity with a setting by its name often leads to barriers in their understanding. And something like hoverboot auto pump, rift tether prompts, they're very game specific terms relating specifically to the mechanics in this game. And they're not immediately obvious to players on what they are. Oops. Um, and then technical speak, this uh, idea that we are in, in game dev, we like to use words that you know we we know a lot, but it's not always something that communicates well to players, to players. So things like traversal, chromatic aberration, and depth of field, which are actually photography terms, but are creeping their way into uh into game um, settings, and something like off-screen ledge guard. These are things that in game dev we know, but players and maybe other people uh, in this talk might not know about. And then abbreviations, two things happening here. Use of a word, uh, the acronym, for instance, HUD, uh, which is heads up display, is offered a barrier for more casual players. And then people with dyslexia, sometimes those barriers can be um, to understanding can come out of things like acronyms. So players with dyslexia told us that this is often a problem for them. And then the last thing here is essentially um, a classic problem, I guess, that the name of the setting and hence player perception does not align with the name of the group. So in this instance, players looking at, looking for aim sensitivity, were trying to find a group name that reflected this. And that was hard because it existed under something called camera. And that's just not um, the sort of what, what they're thinking that they would look for. And then the prefix in some of these aim settings, um, we have a lot of aim settings in this game, um, but when they don't exist together, things get very messy. So in this instance, there's a player telling us that they're, they're looking for uh, aim sensitivity. They've seen a place in which lots of different aim related settings exist, but they're just very confused as to why aim sensitivity is not there. So as I mentioned, all of the previous issues were present across all three variants, but despite this, some of those variants perform better than others. And we're really using two key metrics to measure the effectiveness of these variants, and that's directness and hops. Directness is essentially how easily a player can find the setting without going into the wrong group. And in web terms, we might refer to this behavior as pogo sticking. A direct success is a perfectly correct route and endpoint without interruption. And an indirect success is a correct endpoint, but with some sort of hiccup along the way, maybe they go into a different group at one point. As we did this ex full exposure of the settings groups, almost all of our results are successes rather than fails, i.e. clicking the wrong item, though this actually still did happen. Um, and as such, the indirect success rate is a good insight for us into how easy or difficult it was to find the setting. Another useful metric here is hops, and we classify hops similar to clicks. Each setting has a number, a set number of hops. For instance, it might take two hops to get to aim assist. 
And then if the average amount of hops for all players is vastly above two, then that might indicate a problem for us. So some charts. Here are the directness charts of each variant and the total amount of mean hops, and that's the amount of clicks in and out of menus to reach the final set. That variant three here is uh, essentially ever so slightly better for directness and less likely to incur more hops when players are trying to find a setting. Variant two paints a slightly different picture, leaving more room for error. I'm going to break down performance further. In variant one, when given two possible correct paths through means of that duplication, players often chose the one outside of the accessibility menu most of the time to find these accessibility settings. Again, the exception for this rule is colorblind filters and text-to-speech, which overwhelmingly were found in the accessibility menu. And this matches our findings from round one. As you can see in this table, the right-hand side column shows the total amount of percent of selections for these items made in the accessibility uh, menu for each setting that was duplicated. So the numbers here are pretty low and the majority of people found them uh, the majority of the time in, in um, the main body of settings. Again, that's very different for these two settings. And why is that? Well. Our theory really here is that these are quite pervasive accessibility settings that are very easily understood and also understood outside of video games. They're very clearly also linked directly to accessibility, not necessarily exclusive to games. Alongside that, words like auto and assist that we use to describe some of our settings more often than not drew people to accessibility menus, though these settings could also be found in the main body. And as I said, these are in line with the results that we found from our card sorting. Variant two is the worst performing variant, uh, likely as a result of the settings that we had to move around, which some, sometimes messed with the groupings and group names already set in stone. So Screenshake, for instance, was no longer in the visuals group here, instead in accessibility where it existed as a duplicate. But actually, in, in many in the games industry, making these sort of settings might consider this to be an accessibility setting, but this did not align with players' ideas. And variant three, and this is uh, probably where it gets um, more interesting to us, at least, is basically all the data pointing to variant three being just as effective or even better than variant one. The settings duplicated in variant one and two did not have duplicates here. Uh, in other words, again, there's only one instance of them, yet the directness and hops to those settings were similar or better performing in variant three than they were in variant one and two. And overall, it had the highest rate of directness and fewest hops. What we're looking at here are all the settings that were duplicated in variant one, and a comparison table shows that most of them had fewer hops in variant three, with some exceptions. And for these settings, directness between variant one and two, and this, this chart is uh, showing the sort of um, direct success, indirect success, and failure rate. Um, directness was pretty identical between variant one and two, with the exception of a slightly higher fa failure rate in variant three. So jumping into key learnings, and I'm about to wrap this up. Essentially, we're, what we're sort of trying to get to is how can we make settings clearer to our players? And there's a few things we can do this. Firstly, use accurate and easy to understand wording in settings names. Players won't use a setting they don't understand, and that's a problem because it could help them. And we also spend a lot of time developing these features. Similarly, use accurate descriptions to explain the settings function. Descriptions can help massively, but not when they aren't clear or they are tautological, i.e. describing the misunderstood thing using the same words as the thing that is misunderstood. Name groups and subgroups accurately to signpost to content. Avoid abbreviations and technical language to minimize barriers for those with dyslexia or simply anyone that is not as savvy with video games language as game devs. And test your IA, don't leave it too late. In the games industry, we roll out patches quite a lot, but doing major overhauls on the settings menu after release is going to cause issues with players who are used to using that system already. Finally, be aware that the use of 
words like assist or auto can drive associations towards accessibility related functions. And players expect settings with the same prefix, e.g. aim assist and aim mode to be grouped together. So in summary, this research has kind of given us evidence to support the idea that the use of an accessibility menu does not necessarily allow for more effective findability on the whole. And the method of duplication might not also increase the chances that a player is able to find a setting. With approach that allows these options to be included in the main body of settings and not labeled specifically as accessibility, we can increase the chance of discovery of these amazing settings for all players, from those who need to turn on a high contrast mode to help them see enemies in dark areas or to just those who want to get all the collectibles. Right. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening and also dealing through my tech problems. And I hope I haven't completely derailed the timings of this. So I'm going to stop now. Thanks so much for that, John. Um, we have one question from Helen. Did you have to adapt your study or its materials for participants with access needs? What kinds of changes did you make? Yes, great question. Um, so what we did is we essentially everybody who signed up to the study, we sent them a sort of dummy task to see if um, it would meet those access needs. Um, and we got feedback on um, on that dummy task to be able to to um, to meet those needs. On the most part, the, the changes we had to make were minimal. Um, we also offered for, for those who maybe um, couldn't. Uh, operate maybe a mouse and keyboard easily or had to rely on things that wouldn't work with our with our study um, we offered a moderated session so we could essentially do the card sort for them and they tell us what to do um, but yeah really great question and um, um, absolutely we, we had that consideration from the start